All right, thanks, Tana. Wow, there have been some really good talks today. Um, so I'm just going to show a few slides here to kind of um, describe the setting in terms of nitrogen loading where the, the BWM project has occurred on Cape Cod. Um, Tom already showed us one graph from uh, Jim Galloway. I have another one here. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and so here we're, we're showing that over the past 100 years or so, we've, we've more than doubled the global rate of fixed nitrogen supply uh, to ecosystems. Um, but that nitrogen isn't evenly distributed around the globe. And um, because of their position downstream and down gradient from lots of intense human activity, um, our rivers and estuaries tend to get um, pretty large uh, supply of that nitrogen. And we can see here in terms of kilograms of nitrogen supply per hectare per year that we fertilize lawns and turf at, at this rate here. This is um, agriculture, uh, typical rate of fertilizer application. Chesapeake Bay as a whole uh, receives a similar amount to it in agricultural field. And then some other estuaries uh, receive dramatically more nitrogen than, than uh, agricultural fields do. Um, so thinking about Cape Cod, here we have uh, assembled data from several of my own published studies and some unpublished data. Um, total nitrogen yield in terms of kilograms of nitrogen per square kilometer of watershed per year um, versus population density on those watersheds. And you can see that in watersheds where primary method of wastewater disposal is through septic systems, that um, there's a very strong relationship between population density on the watersheds and the nitrogen yield from the watershed to receiving waters. Um, these black circles here and the green one, these are from Cape Cod. And, and that's about the range of nitrogen inputs um, for the studies, uh, the sites within the BWM project. Uh, these are from uh, the north and south shore of Long Island and one from, uh, from Tampa Bay, uh, Florida. And so these areas have much higher population density and obviously a greater nitrogen load. Um, and we'll also see a little bit of nitrogen isotope data today. And, and so I just want to show quickly that um, as we add um, uh, population density to watersheds, um, we increase the rate of uh, wastewater input to the aquifer. That nitrogen makes its way to the coast and discharges as coastal groundwater discharge. It interacts with wetlands here as it discharges. And um, uh, because wastewater tends to have a, a heavier uh, delta N15 um, <coughs> than, than other sources of nitrogen on the watershed, there's a general relationship in which uh, as you increase the, the percent of the total nitrogen load as wastewater, um, plants and, and, uh, and algae within the receiving waters tend to uh, increase in delta N15. Um, so although the nitrogen loads to some of these watersheds on Cape Cod are moderate in terms of the global range, um, they have enormous impacts on the ecology of the, the receiving estuaries. And this is an algal bloom at the head of Okoit Bay. And um, so the question here is what, uh, whether the uh, salt marshes will also respond to those nitrogen loads. Uh, one of our questions in terms of how salt marshes respond is how uh, they impact the, how nitrogen impacts the greenhouse gas fluxes from salt marshes. And that question was addressed uh, starting a few years ago now with a very simple experiment. Um, the thought being that the greenhouse gases are produced by microbial communities and that microbes can respond quite quickly. My idea was to simply apply some single pulses of nitrogen at concentrations similar to what is reported in groundwater um, in the bays that Kevin was uh, just discussing. And so I did that and over a series of uh, three different dates in Plum Island uh, in the native zones of that marsh, we consistently found uh, pulses of nitrous oxide being emitted. And this was surprising. It was a simple experiment with surprising findings because um, prior to this, the uh, prevailing notion had been that marshes uh, have almost unlimited capacity for taking up nitrogen. Uh, and I don't think anybody would have expected to see an emission of nitrous oxide. Again, this is coming from uh, microbial activities, a, a number of potential sources. Um, 
that was a small scale experiment and one idea that I had was to compare how that differs when you're in a real world situation with very long term nitrogen loads in, uh, in realistic marshes, less pristine than Plum Island. And so I had the advantage of um, being able to move to a new position in Rhode Island where we have what's called the grand experiment in progress. In Rhode Island, there's a bay-wide nitrogen gradient that's larger than what you see in Waquite Bay. And for more than 200 years, that nitrogen gradient has existed. It's only recently that due to investments in um, sewage treatment plant upgrades that that nitrogen level is being decreased significantly. And prior to those uh, big changes, I was able to compare uh, greenhouse gas fluxes at two marshes uh, at almost uh, opposite ends of the nitrogen gradient. They're varying um, by a factor of 200, actually, in terms of the modeled nitrogen loads coming from fertilizer or sewage inputs. And what I'm showing you are uh, the data in purple from one date, uh, one summer date, uh, where I measured nitrous oxide on the top corner here, uh, methane, which is a bit garbled on the other corner, and CO2 at the bottom. Um, and it was significantly higher for all three of those than in the lower nitrogen control, and that was consistent with higher pore water ammonium levels. And um, just to show you how this uh, compares with our results, looks like my circle got uh, moved slightly, um, but these are roughly the Wakoit Bay nitrous oxide concentrations and the corresponding nitrogen loads that have been modeled. And this is Narragansett Bay, the, the higher nitrogen site that I've been looking at. So um, it's possible that uh, the differences and responses that we've seen in greenhouse gas emissions are a function of the nitrogen level. Okay, uh, uh, I just repeat a little bit uh, from yesterday. The idea is we really have to, to understand nitrogen process or nitrogen impact, we really have to understand all the gas fluxes from different components. Uh, so how I get uh, the point? Yeah, so I understand that uh, both uh, the, the uh, vertical flux, the lateral flux, and the methane, and N2O. N2O is not put in here in this slide, but we did measure the N2O fluxes as part of the nitrogen story. So here's just a quick uh, summarize again, and we found, we did not find significant difference in terms of the, uh, the CO2 fluxes across all the nitrogen gradient. We get a signal pattern of the two low nitrogen sites uh, from the, all the way day one, all the way to the end of the year, and we have the respiration, we have the photosynthesis at the blue line, and also we have the NEP, the net result of the gas flux, of CO2 flux of the green line. Across all the together, even though we see the variation, we have not found any significant difference in terms of the, all the gas fluxes. And in terms of the methane, we also have the methane fluxes across the four uh, nitrogen gradient sites. And uh, we have a sage lot with low nitrogen and hamblin no nitrogen, we have high nitrogen. We did found for the, uh, for the methane fluxes in this hamblin low nitrogen site that have higher methane fluxes compared with all other threes. And the eel pond that have lower methane fluxes compared with the other sites. I think the reason is not because of nitrogen. We see there's a low, including all low and high, so it's probably driving more by the salinity rather than by nitrogen. So the idea is the other factor, side effect, influence those methane fluxes. Basically, the habiting have a lower uh, salinity level, so that is a higher methane fluxes. And for the eel pond, that, have, that has uh, contained a higher salinity level that possibly result in the lower uh, the methane fluxes. So in terms of the other two sides, sage lot and grape pond, they have a significant, there's a difference of nitrogen loading, but we don't see, we have not seen much difference in the methane fluxes. So the idea is, the, the basic conclusion for methane fluxes, I think it's more driving by the salinity rather than by nitrogen. But again, as Serena mentioned, we are talking about the small range of nitrogen here. In uh, Wakoe Bay, it's about zero to 10, Gram for nitrogen per square meter per year compared with other sites that have higher nitrogen loading. About the nitrogen oxide emissions, 
And for all the sites, it's about this level. It's very insignificant. It's uh, close to zero for micromole, for nanomole per square meter per second. However, we did do some of the short-term nitrogen experiment, basically the nitrogen addition experiment. If we add nitrogen in, we did found significant amount of increase of N2O within a very short time period. For example, if we add nitrogen here from the baseline here, and within the four hours, we can see significant increasing of N2O fluxes. And then the N2O fluxes going down quickly because of the tide. Basically, after tide get in, the water wash away all the addition of nitrogen, so that causes the decrease of nitrogen immediately. So that nitrogen addition experiment is very short term over there. Uh, if we put a short, short amount of nitrogen in, in a nitrogen in a small amount of a small location. So that the basic conclusion is in the baseline of nitrogen and total flux is small. But if we add some of the uh, nitrogen there, for example, you add 1.4 of gram nitrogen per square meter in one time addition, then we did see sudden increase of N2 fluxes in a, in a short term period of time. And about the above ground biomass, which is MPP, we also uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, clipping and of the marshes across the four sites. And we also measured three, across the three times of the year. And for the above ground biomass, we did not find significant difference across the four sites. The total amount of biomass is about 500 gram of biomass per square, me per square meter per year. If we convert to carbon, it's about, if we divide by two, a biomass is a gram of carbon, it's about 300 gram of carbon per square meter per year in terms of bio biomass. So compared with the GPP, it's about uh, seven to 800. So we know the amount of the MPP is, above one MPP is less, a little less than half of the total GPP. Uh, root, we also have a root and rhizome biomass data across all five sites. We collect from 10 to 0 to 10 all the way to 40 to 50 centimeter of the depth, including root and rhizome all together. And put together, we found that across the site, there are difference in the above, uh, below ground biomass. The basic in the Hebelin, Hebelin site, that there are basically low, uh, low nitrogen sites, they are higher of the below ground biomass. And also for gray pond here, sorry, for the eel pond here, that has a lower level of below ground biomass. I'll show you another figure here. Here's a give, give a more understanding. So again, for a bow ground here, the bow ground, this is uh, the color, orange color showing the bow ground. This is high nitrogen and low nitrogen, low nitrogen, high nitrogen site. And for a bow ground, as I said, we don't have any difference in terms of bow ground biomass. But for below ground, put all the roots and the rhizome together, we see the eel pond has higher above, uh, below ground biomass. And the gray pond also has higher uh, below ground biomass compared with uh, uh, low nitrogen. Uh, the uh, sage lot pond and heblin pond. So that is uh, make us very difficult understanding why in the high nitrogen site that will result in the higher below ground biomass. I think uh, we, we think this is because it's not just a live root. This below ground contains all the dead and live roots over there. So put together, I think high uh, nitrogen, relatively high nitrogen, actually result in the higher below ground biomass. So here's a quick summary. And for the small amount of nitrogen loading to one to 10 of gram of nitrogen per square meter per year, that did not result in the change of the carbon fluxes. This because, likely because of nitrogen loading via groundwater was primarily used by micro and phytoplankton, but for small, for so much and greenhouse gas again, Gas emission may be significant change when nitrogen loading can ex increase to some of the threshold level. But below that, we did not see much change. However, for the N2O, if we add some of the nitrogen in, they can have a short kind of pulse effect of N2O. But within the long term, we did not see much difference in N2O fluxes. About the below ground biomass, we did see some difference across the nitrogen site. 
But for brown, bo brown ground biomass, we have not found the difference across the nitrogen side. I think which is similar for, for other research studies. And Tom just mentioned the, the nitrogen is not really change much of the bow ground the so much. Spartana, not much on Spartana. Okay, thank you. I also measured the nitrogen isotopic composition of the organic matter in the, in the cores that I showed you earlier today. And um, that's what's shown here. So this is depth, um, and now I'm showing the full from modern down to the, ba uh, the, the basal peat layer. And one thing I want you to see is that, so this is isotopes that are lighter over here, heavier over here. And as Kevin mentioned, heavier isotopes um, indicate usually anthropogenic sources. And so you can see, um, so this is sage lot. These are ordered in terms of low to high. Um, so sage lots are lowest and grape ponds are highest nitrogen loading site. And you can see we do have these increases and they're starting around 1900 um, or sometimes a little earlier here and here of in an increase in the um, nitrogen isotopic composition. So it's getting heavier. So there's evidence that these, these salt marshes are seeing anthropogenic nitrogen. So it's not that the salt marshes aren't experiencing it. So we can say this response we're seeing isn't, um, is due to, they are seeing the nitrogen. And so we are confident that um, it's not that it's just being put in and maybe the salt marshes aren't seeing it. And if you look here at the bottom a plot, um, you can see there's a pretty good relationship between the nitrogen load that's predicted by the end load model and the kind of um, total uh, uh, weight of the, of the nitrogen isotopic composition at the top of the cores. And so these, these cores are seeing it, but we're not seeing any change um, with nitrogen load and carbon burial. There's no, there's no, this is that high marsh core that's burying less carbon, but there's no change here. There's no relationship. So at this moderate level, of nitrogen loading, we're not seeing an impact on the carbon storage capacity. Um, and so I think that finishes the BWM nitrogen story.